Okay, well, the last lecture went so well. Uh, I decided to continue with the last um, opportunity to give you a pep talk on, well, actually, this one is actually pretty relevant. Okay. Um, earlier, we talked about the limitations of science. We said that is science infallible? Well, no, remember? Said no, no, science is at the very best is only going to give us a, some support for hypothesis. We never really prove it. It's never giving us proof beyond a doubt. That's not what science does, right? So in that respect, science is limited. Uh, the fact that science is carried out by humans who are fallible is going to give a whole another dimension to the fallibility of science. But the, the question at hand right now is, are there things that science really can't help us address? And, and, and the answer to that is totally yes. Okay, And I've taken the liberty of identifying uh, four topics that are extremely divisive in the United States in 2022. And, um, and I, I guess uh, what I want you to think about here is to what degree can science help us with addressing, um, with, with helping us inform our opinions about uh, these issues, right? Uh, guns, right? Firearms, are they good? Are they bad? Is there any possible way that you can think of uh, where science can, uh, you know, can, can weigh in at all on that issue? No, right? There's no way that a scientist can say, uh, can have any, um, you know, weighty opinion on the validity of, you know, guns being something that is an inalienable right versus guns being something that um, uh, should be eliminated uh, for the good of, of, of humankind. I, I, you know, I, I don't think this is an area where I, as a scientist, can uh, offer any uh, insight. Right? Abortion might be actually something closer to, um, closer to biology, but but really, I mean, when you think about it, with the, the questions that abortion issues are concerned with are, are things like, well, when does life begin? Does it happen when you have the first heartbeat? Does it happen when you are no longer able to live without any additional support? Is it or maybe when you can live with even with support? Okay. When does life begin? And um, maybe even more to the point, where does life uh, deserve to have protection by the law, right? I, I don't know. I have no idea. And there's no scientist that I know that could actually use science as a means of answering these kinds of questions, right? So yeah, there, there are total limits to what science can tell us. Now, when we look at some other issues like uh, climate change, is it real? Is it a hoax? Hey, you know what? Uh, this is totally a sciencey issue. Uh, uh, vaccines too. I mean, uh, is there uh, any truth to the idea that vaccines are going to be uh, protecting us from getting you know, COVID nineteen? Or, uh, or having severe effects. I think, you know, there, there's definitely uh, some opportunity for scientists to weigh in with um, evidence-based statements regarding these issues, right? And so what I wanna do with this uh, lecture is to focus particularly on the issue of science, of, of, of the science behind climate change. Okay. And so there's going to be a little more history. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go over what the basic mechanism is of global warming and atmospheric carbon. That's not really the main thing here. Okay. Uh, there are some, you know, it's a really interesting uh, area. And if you want more detail, I would recommend that we take you take um, our class at Maricosta on the science of climate change. We actually have a class that's taught by one of uh, you know, my favorite um, colleagues, Jonathan Cole, and um, I think he's teaching it pretty much every semester nowadays. Right. So, so first of all, remember back to our discussions of science, we said that with science, there's some type of phenomenon that requires explanation. Right. 
And, uh, and what a hypothesis does is it offers an explanation for that phenomenon, and then you can go about testing that hypothesis uh, for validity. Now, it, it doesn't always follow that script, right? Because in the case of climate change, if you go back um, before we have, we have we had any substantive evidence supporting the idea that the Earth was actually getting warmer, right? Yeah, I mean, there, we've got good evidence now, right? But before we actually had the evidence supporting the idea that things were getting warmer, um, because we already knew that uh, carbon dioxide, the physical properties of carbon dioxide were such that it would be able to uh, absorb heat and, and then re-radiate it back in different directions. Basically, it absorbs heat from one direction and it radiates the heat in all different directions, including the direction back from which it came. And the, and the reason why that's important is because if this is the Earth's surface, okay? Uh, the Earth's surface gets warmed by the, by the sun and then it starts radiating heat out, right? And so there's a general direction of radiant uh, heat energy from the Earth's surface into outer space. And what carbon dioxide does, what CO2 does, this thermal blanket, is that it intercepts the heat coming out and it redirects some of it back towards the Earth. And in fact, the, the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the more we expect this thermal blanketing effect to take hold, right? Yeah. And, and it didn't take um, a whole lot of thought to make this prediction. If you know that the properties of CO2 uh, include the fact that it's not transparent to infrared radiation, which is heat. We know that CO2 is going to absorb in, uh, heat radiant energy and redirect it back in the direction. And so if we don't have a whole lot of CO2, that's going to allow a lot more energy to escape the Earth's surface, whereas if we have a, a really thick blanket of CO2, much more of that heat is going to be retained in the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, we, we knew this. We we knew that this was a property of CO2, and we predicted that given an increased amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, if we were to increase CO2 in the atmosphere, and we knew that was happening because, well, we've been um, extracting fossil fuels like coal and petroleum and burning CO2 uh, with internal combustion engines, basically all that activity of humankind was really having the effect of adding uh, a year-by-year -year, uh, input of CO2 of, of this form of atmospheric carbon to the atmosphere. And it was relatively easy to predict at that point that one effect that we might expect in the future would be that the increased thermal blanketing effect would have the effect of causing global warming, right? Now, this is, again, before we have any data in support of this. Right, but 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 now at this point we actually have the data. Right, uh, at this point we could actually say, well, we have the fact that the Earth has gotten a whole lot warmer in the past few decades, and uh, this is a phenomenon that requires explanation. Right, uh, what well, what I'm telling you here is that at the time that we first made the predictions of climate change, global warming. It was before we had any phenomenon to explain, but we knew that it was coming, right? We could use our understanding of the properties of carbon dioxide, the properties of the way that the earth was intercepting light from the sun, warming on its surface and radiating that, out, that heat out into, the, into, the, uh, into outer space. We knew that an increased uh, concentration of CO2 of carbon dioxide would have the effect of thermal blanketing resulting in global warming. Okay, let, let's uh, look at some data. Um, because the data here is actually really kind of nice. If you look on uh, 38.3, um, this is a really great picture. Notice that the 10 hottest years, hot, you know, so we've, we've had um, estimates of global temperature since 1880, right? Uh, the 10 hottest years on record are from 1997 onward. And so, I mean, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that this is demonstrating for us that things are definitely getting warmer. And, and, and I guess um, now we actually have a phenomenon that uh, requires explanation. 
And maybe our explanation will have something to do with that thermal blanketing effect that we talked about uh, in lecture shortly ago, right? Now here's another picture that shows the, that the, um, the, the temperatures between 2005 and 2015 are way hotter compared to what we had historically between 1951, 1980. Right? And, and, and so, yeah, there's, you know, the, uh, the phenomenon of warming is a real clear uh, valid point. It's, uh, yeah, that part is the fact. That's the observation that we now requires explanation. And then we've got to go back to our, uh, our uh, drawing board and think about, well, what would be the cause for that kind of warming, right? So yeah, at this point, we're right here. We're saying, now we don't need to work with a predicted pattern of climate change. We actually have the pattern of climate change right there slapping us in the face. And we need to explain how that works, right? The first part of this is, is basically explaining that, uh, well, you know, is it carbon dioxide? Is it uh, atmospheric carbon? Because not just carbon dioxide, you also have methane, CH4, you've got uh, nitrous oxides, you've got, you know, basically there are a number of potential emissions that are there in the atmosphere that could be contributing to this global warming effect. But CO2 is the main one. And, uh, and I guess the question is, well, is it true that CO2 is the cause of global warming? Well, um, th this is maybe something that's a little bit more difficult to express. I mean, you, you, can, do, you can do things circumstantially. You can say, yes, CO2 has been increasing steadily. You've got the data from the top of Mount Aloha, right? Uh, the top of the mountain in Hawaii that says that every year, we see a pattern of increases and a little decrease and a big increase and a little decrease, and a big increase. And we see this pattern of zigzagging upwards in atmospheric CO2, okay? Now before uh, 1970 or so, it was roughly around 300 parts per million. That's a, a number that gets bandied around, right? So parts per million means, well, 300 parts per million would be like, um, 0.3 parts per thousand, which basically be 0.03%, right? So I wanted to, to make this converted into a, a value that you might be more familiar with. It's like 1%, you know what that is, one out of 100. And we're saying that um, 300 parts per million is about 0.03%. Which is, you know, really, you know, legitimately a small amount of CO2, right? But if we look at this today, we're talking about something like on the order of 450 parts per million, which, uh, again, it's still just 0.045 percent, right? But it's still a 50 percent increase relative to where it was not that long ago, right? This is a substantial difference, and so if um, if we're seeing increases in CO2, only looking at CO2 there, never mind the CH4 and other kinds of great greenhouse gases. If we look only at CO2, this corresponds to a linear increase. Are we seeing temperatures following that same pattern of increase? And if, if temperatures follow the same pattern, then that would support the idea that uh, carbon dioxide is actually the cause for temperature changes. And yeah, it, it seems like we have a significant amount of support that the actual cause for the warming that we're observing is atmospheric carbon, right? The second part of the hypothesis says that humans are the ones that are responsible for elevated atmospheric carbon. Um, is carbon there for other reasons besides humans? I mean, because if you were to wipe out humans from the, uh, from the planet Earth, you would still have quite a bit of carbon dioxide production, right? You would, all, you would have all the red pandas and giant pandas and raccoons breathing with every breath they're releasing carbon dioxide as well as all the other animals, right? Um, you would have volcanoes and fires and all of these things contribute carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Would it be um, 
any different without the humans versus with the humans? Well, well yeah, it, it totally would. Um, and there's a nice diagram from the textbook that demonstrates why this is. Because if you're not aware of this, um, we have this um, uh, propensity to uh, be really enamored with um, the use of fossil fuels, right? Um, you know, in addition to the normal cellular respiration, forest fires, exchange, uh, this factor of the com combustion of fossil fuels by industry, uh, by uh, motor vehicles, and uh, by uh, by homes, by residential homes, um, is something that we don't find in the absence of humans, right? We would still have photosynthesis without humans. We would still have a lot of cellular respiration. We would still have the oceans having their exchange, but without humans, this gigantic pulse of atmosphere carbon into the atmosphere is something that we would not have. Right. I don't know if you can see this pop up that came up. Hoping I could make it disappear. It won't disappear now. Right. So yeah, I mean the the uh, the, the flip side is the the other part of this argument says that well, humans are the res are responsible for the cause of CO two. CO two is the cause of global warming. And if that's the case, then uh, the question that we can't answer in science is. Should we be concerned about this, right? right? You know, the two parts of the puzzle are saying uh, are supportable by, by by science, right? Science can say, yeah, um, I can give you a fairly high degree of confidence that humans are the cause for CO2. I can give you a very high degree of confidence that CO2 is the cause of the global warming. What I can't tell you, people, uh, I, what I can't tell you, Mr. President, Mr. Uh, oh, democracy of the United States is whether or not we should be concerned about global warming. Maybe people want to promote global warming. Maybe we need to increase the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted in the atmosphere. And yet, these are judgments that need to be uh, made at a different scale, right? Um, we can say with pretty certain, with pretty great certainty that uh, allowing carbon dioxide emissions to continue into the future, it's not going to restore things back to the way they were in the 1950s, which is the way a lot of us would like things to, to be. Not me, but uh, there are plenty of people that think that the 1950s were like the uh, golden years of, uh, of existence in the United States. Uh, or would, would we uh, be able to restore 1950s climate if we continued to about lots of CO2 in the atmosphere? No, probably not, right? That much science can weigh in. On. Do we actually want to uh, restore things back to 1950s? That's the other question that science cannot answer. All right. So I thought this was, a, you know, yeah, what, I, what I've tried to do here is to do, um, to go in a couple of different directions. I wanted to uh, continue with the theme that we, we uh, began last time. We were talking about um, things other than strictly clinical medicine. Uh, this lecture in particular was a little bit more um, germane to our ongoing discussion because we got a chance to think about uh, the limitations of science, which is the topic we covered last week. At the same time that you got a chance to sample um, an area of scientific inquiry that might be a little bit different from what you would be getting in your normal nursing and uh, pre-dental hygiene and pre-physical therapy and pre-EMT uh, classes you might be taking at Maricosta and, uh, and beyond. All right. Uh, with the next lecture, we start talking about chemistry in a real way. So uh, be prepared for that. Ciao.